This is Paul Schmid. Welcome to the Pursuit Zone. As a child, Bria Shirky traveled to eastern Russia ten times, first setting foot in Siberia at age four while visiting her father's expeditions. As a first grader, she went to the North Pole and grew up among sled dogs near Ely, Minnesota, learning to be a musher and becoming an accomplished Nordic skier. Bria has worked at medical facilities in India, Kenya, and Somalia, and has worked as an instructor for the National Outdoor Leadership School. In June of 2013, Bria returned to Russia with Alexander Martin, and the two set out on a 2,900-kilometer canoeing expedition in northern Mongolia, central Siberia, and far eastern Russia as part of their Asia Rivers expedition. You can learn more about their adventure at facebook.com slash Asia Rivers Expedition. Bria Shirky, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Hi, thanks for having me. Bria, do you remember anything about your childhood days in Russia? I do, actually. I think they're probably some of the more formative memories. It was just such a drastic, uh, drastically different place from my home in Minnesota, being in far eastern Russia, and these kind of cold, darker cities, but also full of life. Like, you go into these people's homes, and into our friends' homes, and there's always a lot of dancing, and I just remember the colorful, uh, like, wooden toys and colorful plates and and lots of food and um, music. And so it was a very distinct memory because it was so different from what was at home. And also a really beautiful place. I think people think of Siberia as this cold and desolate, barren, awful landscape. But it's actually, it's very vibrant and memorable landscape with just sometimes large mountains and vast landscapes. So, yeah, it's, it's quite beautiful. And I do remember that distinctly as a kid, as well as just the wonderful Russian friends that we continued to visit and travel with while we were there. Do you speak any Russian? I do. It's, it comes and goes. I, um, but I think, you know, I, I didn't grow up speaking a second language, uh, but Russian certainly I feel like is the language that I resonate, the second language that I resonate with the most because I had heard it so often as a child and then I studied it in college and after college. Um, and so I can get by. It's, it's, I'd say it's more than survival language. It's probably an intermediate and I can, I can read it, but I, yeah, I can't say I'm proficient or fluent, but I'm working on it. So Bria, how did you become a part of this expedition? Uh, well, I work for the National Outdoor Leadership School, like you said, and uh, Alexander Martin also works for the school, and so we're co- co-leaders. We've never led a trip together, but we often had seen each other at just different staff events, and um, we met, well, actually, honestly, we only met once over a five-minute beer, and then a year later, he sent out this mass email looking for partners on a canoeing expedition, and he said, I, I think I've got grant funding I'm looking for someone who is willing to take off their summer and might have some Russian language experience and is interested in canoeing. And I, like within seconds, just sent him an email back that just said, yes, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, I'm in and 100% guaranteed. And uh, didn't even think twice about what I had made plans about already. I just knew that I was definitely... I was definitely in as soon as I heard, and unfortunately, no one else really had was able to make the time, and so it just ended up being the two of us, and yeah, I was really grateful that he had considered me as one of the people to ask. Uh, Bria, did you get involved in any of the fundraising? It was difficult for me because I was traveling for about five, four months before um, during kind of the primary fundraising season but we, so we did a lot of our fundraising online through in Diego as well as the uh, Polytech grant which was which was wonderful to have received that and Xander has been he had been on another kind of series of expeditions and so a lot of his sponsors I think kind of carried over for this expedition because he had he had also canoed across the United States uh, canoed and walked and then canoed across Europe and then biked across Central Asia and so this was kind of the last big chunk uh, the big wilderness aspect of his his longer 
expedition almost or, almost around the world, although he, he's careful to not say uh, circumnavigation. But yeah, so we it had been a series of different sponsors through his trip, and then a lot of friends kind of jumped on board when they found out we were doing this trip and just supported us online. So you guys are in two different kind of parts of the world, and you have to converge on um, Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. Is that correct? Yeah, yep. But before you got there, you were in Somalia, right? Yes, yep. I have pictures of me, like, trip prepping in Somalia, and I had brought, I might be the first person to have ever brought a winter sleeping bag, mountaineering boots, and I think I had, like, my paddling gloves and a dry bag with me in Somalia, (laughs) as well as some of our sponsored gear from Polar Tech, some Patagonia shirts and jackets uh, so I have a few pictures of me like wearing um, it's not a burqa but like a, a headscarf as well as all of my my gear um, standing on the rooftop of the hospital that I was interning at where with my winter sleeping bag in the background and it was probably like 105 degrees out <laughs> so it was difficult because I had limited internet access while I was in in it's part of Somali called Somali land and it was difficult to really kind of contact Xander, and he was on his other expedition at the time. And uh, so we basically just said, all right, well, let's just meet in Ulaanbaatar on June 20th and um, kind of go from there. And, and that's kind of what happened. Now, when I heard you speak, I, I wrote this down in my notes that I wanted to ask you about what you were, what were you doing in Somaliland? Yeah, so I was interning at the Edna Auden University Maternity Hospital, and it's considered uh, maybe one of the best and most prominent maternity hospitals in Somaliland. Somalia has one of the world, it's competing really with Chad as having the highest maternal and child mortality rates in the world. Uh, About 1,600 women per 100,000 births die every year while delivering. And uh, and so my interest, I'm a student right now at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health studying maternal and child global health, and I'm interested in looking at ways to reduce high maternal mortality. And one of those ways is promoting public health, so preventative issues, as well as uh, promoting the training of skilled birth attendants. And so I was in... I was helping out at the hospital, working with the public health students there and just teaching classes and um, just tutoring and and then working directly with patients as far as documenting patient issues and and kind of looking for outside source funding because they don't have... They, yet, they don't quite yet have resources to do pretty like fairly serious surgeries um, that they have to they have to often transport patients to Ethiopia or even Australia or the UK to get major surgery done. And so it was my first time there. It was kind of an initial visit. I knew I was interested in working with a Somali population. Um, and on a whim, I was I got the green light to go. I was kind of surprised, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity to to visit a place like Somaliland. And it was a, an incredible experience, uh, but also very difficult. There are a lot of hardships, but there are a lot of people that from Somalia and Somalia and from the diaspora as well who are really motivated to make some change and address some major issues from the um, post-conflict issues going on that are yeah very prominent. So it's a, it's a beautiful place. The people are really wonderful there. Where do you stay? Do you have your own apartment or are you, are you living with a local family? How does yeah. it work? Yeah, well, it's, I had, I lived in a little apartment upstairs in the hospital, and uh, there are a few security issues still. It's not it's not like uh, India or Kenya where I could totally feel comfortable walking out in the street. I still had to remain full, fairly covered, and um, if I was out of the city, I had to have an armed guard, and it was a very unique situation for me as just having to be really mindful of security and, and to be respectful of that. So I kind of stayed in this apartment and then it worked in the hospital and went out into the streets a, a few times. But, yeah, you just, I would hate to be a liability for the organization that was willing to let me come and, and work for them. So, yeah, I had this nice little apartment and then I uh, lived amongst other doctors that were um, expats from Ethiopia and Kenya. So, yeah, it was a really, really neat experience. So you made your way to Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia for the start of the mm-hmm. expedition. And while you were there, what did you, did you have any last minute things that you guys had to do? What happened? Yeah. 
Well, I had yet to get my Russian visa. It was kind of this debacle with the organization that I had tried to get my visa through in the United States. And so I had to buy two passports and send one back to get a Russian visa. So we had to wait in Ulaanbaatar for another five days, running around the city trying to find where my passport had basically been delivered. We also went to the, there's like, it's not a real black market, but I think they like to refer to it as kind of the black market. And it's this really neat street market where you can go, you can buy like all sorts of probably ivory and illegal <laughs> teeth, and uh, but a lot of the kind of the Mongolian cowboys come and buy their their goods for their horses and the just the well the horsemen come and buy their boots and this beautiful elaborate belts and hats and all sorts of really cool stuff and uh, so we had to kind of go and do our major shopping there as well. I, I had to buy a tent and a sleeping pad, and we had to kind of sit down and put our heads together and think about every little thing we would need and would not be able to buy from here on out because after Ulan Bator, uh there was only one other bigger city kind of that we were going to be going through in northern Mongolia, but yeah, we were going to be fairly limited. Our biggest issue was figuring out how to set up a boat rig, uh, like a rescue rig, and get like strong enough rope and a pulley system in case you know we ever got pinned or uh, needed to pull our boat out of a rapids or something. So that was difficult to find. But it was it was really fun because we were walking in this market with all these Mongolian horsemen and and kind of bartering with them for their horse. The, the rope that they use for their horses, basically, and trying to, with sign language, figure out, <laughs> you know, what rope was strong. And um, But it was easy there to buy kind of some dried goods and some, like, nuts and trail food, basically. Um, there's a lot of fun markets. The meat market is really interesting in Mongol, in uh, Ulaanbaatar and um, some fish. And, uh, yeah, so we really enjoyed ourselves in, in, in that city. It's a very dynamic, colorful city, kind of in these two different worlds. You have the modern city where you've got, you walk past these buildings where they're flashing television kind of billboards of like the Mongolian fashion show. And then next door is this little yurt and a family living in a yurt in the middle of the city wearing their traditional cowboy boots and like, I don't know what you call it, like a traditional Mongolian jackets and and so it's yeah it's two different worlds kind of mingled together in this very colorful um, fairly dirty <laughs> fairly congested but vibrant city so just navigating through that and enjoying our last bit of city life before we were out in the wilderness for the rest of the summer. Is this where you had to give yourselves you had to vaccinate yourselves? Yeah, um, that's right. So we we had found out months before that uh, we were going to be traveling in a, in like a tick-borne encephalitis hot zone. Like our whole route was on the red line for the, where tick-borne encephalitis was most prominent in the world, um, as well as some Japanese encephalitis. But of course, the United States does not offer a vaccine for tick-borne encephalitis. We would have had to have flown to Canada, and I wasn't even in the States, and Xander, actually, he wasn't even in the States most of the time. And so the only place we were like, we could get the vaccination was in Mongolia, but it's a three dose vaccination that you're really supposed to spread out over a few months. But we found this this wonderful doctor, a uh, Mongolian doctor who gave us the vaccinations <laughs> and we had him in a little cooler and we, we got the first dose from him, waited a few days and then we each had to give each other a vaccination in the hospital. And then my third vaccination, Dander had already had a few, um, was actually on the river. We had to keep my vaccination cold in a little cool, in a cooler with ice. And I have a picture of where we're sitting on this rock in the middle of these rapids. We did this more for effect because we thought it'd be a really great photo. And I'm like cringing and Xander's trying to give me a shot in my shoulder with this vaccination. And yeah, and on we went. It's just a, yeah, we we decided to take the risk of doing the vaccinations ourselves and getting the vaccination at least versus not having anything because it, it would be a terrible, a, a terrible, terrible disease to get. Um, and we were going to be playing in the woods for the whole summer. So we, we felt that that was the smart, the best option that we had under the guidance of a, a great doctor. So, <laughs> Did you guys ever find any ticks on yourselves? 
You know, we we didn't actually, um, and I think it was because we were so concerned about the issue that we uh, we really protected ourselves really well that that we it, we it never turned out to be an issue. Yeah, so we were lucky. Tell me about the canoes you were using. Yeah, we uh, we were really lucky and got a sponsorship from Bergens, and they lent us an alley canoe, which is a a standard. I think it's eighteen foot collapsible canoe that fit inside a large backpack and I'm I'm a pretty petite female about 120 pounds 5'4 in this backpack when I would carry it around just completely engulfed me and looked like I was I mean if I fell over it would just <laughs> it would completely cover my body it's like it's huge and it's got these I you know as Xander's much better with the technicalities but um, uh, aluminum poles and uh, kind of make the frame and we'd have to you know, set it up and collapse it every time we had to get on a train or over a portage. But yeah, it was an amazing canoe. I, I often it just felt like I was in the Winona, except for that sometimes the person in the bow gets bounced. I never got bounced completely out of the canoe, but there's enough. It's it's flexible enough that in big big water and big waves that you kind of get thrown about a little bit. But I highly recommend these canoes for anyone interested and uh, doing extensive international travel. It just makes travel so much easier on trains and planes. We we checked in our bags on the international flight for free, including the, the canoe backpack. And uh, it was funny because the, the people at the airport, when we told when they asked what was inside the bag and we said it was a boat, like <laughs> wide-eyed and, um, and did not believe us. So, but eventually convinced them that there really was a canoe inside this backpack. Um, but a wonderful boat, and I would go anywhere in the world with with the Bergen's Alley Alley canoes. How are you guys navigating? Vayner had gotten a hold of these uh, these maps online that were um, these Soviet maps online that were not allowed. To the, for public viewing until I think it was the 90s or something and the, um, and on the top right corner in Russian it says secret <laughs> so, but now they're free and open to the public but these people pl- traveling or uh, living in eastern Russia they don't have inter- often don't have internet access and they're not aware that these are public um, open to the public now and so we, we we got these maps It was they were the best maps that we could find as far as with the best scale and so we were traveling with these maps, and sometimes we'd show up in a village, and we'd we'd pull these things out, and we'd have like a you know kind of an older Russian dude sitting there on the beach on the shoreline, and um, we'd pull out these maps and show it to him, and he'd just be wide-eyed with disbelief that we had access to these things, and they'd kind of look at us like, "Who are you? Like, why do you have these maps? Like, where did you come from? And how did you how did you get a hold of these things?" And we'd have to explain, "No, no, they're they're legal. It's okay to have them now." But yeah, you know, it's kind of it. We just have these. I mean, that's it. We just have these maps, and I mean, Google Maps was helpful in the beginning to kind of figure out um, our general route. Some of the rivers we had heard about from just some old stories and um, other people who had gone before. Of course, Lake Baikal is, has has been well traveled, and a lot of people kayak, well, circumnavigate, circumnavigate the lake, and um, and then the Amur is the tenth largest river. So there's a lot of maps available and information on that. But some of the other rivers, like the Chulut and the Vitam, which are tiny or more unknown rivers more difficult to find inform- any information on. You can Google them and find a tidbit, but that we kind of, I would say a l- there was a little bit of crossing fingers on the Chulut and the Vitam River, just hoping that we weren't going to, we'd see these big canyons on the map, but we couldn't really tell how fast the water was really moving or what obstacles were there. So, um, yeah, but at times we we weren't quite sure what the next day was going to bring, and and luckily luckily there were only two times that we really had some major portaging to go through. But otherwise, it was it was a really incredible canoe route, and I highly recommend anyone who's interested in canoeing in Mongolia or Russia to check out our route because they are spectacular rivers, spectacular undammed rivers with beautiful mountain scenery and wonderful little villages along the way. It was very inviting people and uh, it was kind of a smooth trip, to be honest. <laughs> it, it, we we were really lucky and it was, it was a smooth riding trip. Yeah, spectacular. 
Bria, can you take us through the expedition? I sort of have it in my notes as occurring in four parts. The Chalute, Lake Baikal, I forget how you pronounce it, the Vi- the Vitim or the Vitim River and the Amur River. Yep, the Vitim. Yeah. Um, what, we- what are sort of the highlights that you remember about each of those stages? Sure. Yeah, well, the first, we started out driving in a, in a Prius of all vehicles. We, got, we rented a taxi and it was a guy in a Prius who drove us from this village we had taken a bus to in northern Mongolia, and he drove us west to kind of just mile marker X, I don't know exactly what it was, and dropped us off at the Chulu River, which is this narrow, beautiful river, narrow, quite, there's a lot of rapids, um, and fairly shallow, and, you know, the Mongolian plateau is very flat, but the rivers feel like make you feel like you're in this mountainous region because they're very deep canyons, and so our first few days were pretty exciting rapids, actually, and I was like, <laughs> what are we got ourselves into? <laughs> the first day, two days, and we're at class two, maybe, eh, I don't think we hit class three, but, you know, decent rapids for the boat that we were in, and, and it was fast and windy rivers and, like, a lot of horses. That was the greatest thing, is immediately there's just these beautiful Mongolian horses and, and big herds that hang out by the rivers, and sometimes they're swimming across the river, and, of course, when I first saw the first herd, I'd take my camera out, I'm taking pictures of every single horse, and and by day three, they were almost a nuisance, because they were just everywhere, and like every corner, there's just another herd of horses that we had to dodge <laughs> around on the river, and then we saw, uh, we we actually like slalomed around a herd of camels one time, and that was, that was awesome, and then uh, sometimes you'd see cattle as well. But yeah, paddling in Mongolia is is such a great experience, and there's a lot of Mongolian horse riders that you know the Mongolians that live in their yurts in the summer along the river, and not too close, so they kind of live up on the hill. But uh, you'd see these little boys; they go into the herd and they wrangle, they rope one horse and they pull it in and they um, hop on it, and then they just go racing down the plateau along the shoreline and. Um, back to the, like, to the, go visit their buddies at the next little inlet up ahead. And, uh, it's just a really, yeah, very magical, colorful place and, um, wonderful weather, blue skies practically every day in Mongolia. And then, so we worked our way north. And then uh, the second section, I would say, was paddling across Lake Baikal, is, which is a totally different world. It's, uh, from paddling in Mongolia. And Lake Baikal is, I can't say enough about that place. It's it's also a very dynamic lake, and we went from south to north, um, and it started out kind of along these beaches with a lot of tourists and these uh, very Russian like setting where they're they're out there just, like frying themselves, and they're um, in the sun on these beaches, and it's very cold water, but they're Russian. I don't think they care, and um, they're playing in the water, and they've got their hummers like driving down the beach, and it's, you don't expect this in Lake Baikal because it's on the pictures I think we see in National Geographic and stuff. It's like the picturesque, picturesque, isolated, massive lake, but really there's a lot of life to it, and a lot of uh, like fishing villages, and I think uh, some timber villages, and uh, maybe a little bit of mining, and uh, and so we worked our way north, and then about a third of the way north, it becomes it turns into like a national park and, and much more wilderness. And then you it's just these grand landscapes where I felt like I was paddling on a, on the ocean next to the wind river mountains of Wyoming. Cause these big dramatic peaks that follow along the, the lakeside and wonderful campsites, like these cobble beaches and these, these beautiful rocks. Um, and the water is very clear. I, we never treated the water in Lake Baikal, uh, although by the Delta, where there's more populations, we we didn't drink that water. It was pretty mucky. But once you get out, it's crystal clear. And there's some freshwater seal that we'd see off in the distance, and they they poke their little head out of the water and kind of check us out. But they're pretty scared of humans for good reason. I think there's a lot of poaching that goes on um, that kills the uh, they kill the uh, freshwater seals for their skin. So we just see these guys in the distance, but uh, yeah, a northern bug lake. That the northern part of the lake, we didn't see as much traffic. We saw a couple of people that were kayaking. We'd stop at a couple of national park offices, and you'd meet this like one lone Russian park ranger who's just kind of sitting there by himself, holding on the fort, a 
saw a lot of grizzly signs. Almost, I would say, every campsite, practically every night, we would see grizzly bear prints along the shoreline where they they walk in the evenings. I think just eating the the flies that come out at night or something. Or we never saw a bear though on Lake Baikal, so we were lucky. But we had to take a lot of precautions because we were not able to bring. Uh, any kind of like a gun or a bear spray even. We we took a lot of time to try to find bear spray, but we were not able to find anything. So we just had a little like a dog pepper spray, protector of man and woman, like a little tiny thing. And I don't know what that would have even done, but the Russians assured us that it was not going to be an issue. But we we knew that the grizzly bear and like the call were much larger. Um, There had not been many stories of incidences, but we still took a lot of precautions as far as like sleeping far from our food and cooking in a a different location from where we were sleeping and not having any smellable things inside our tent and then having like a paddle outside of our our tent. And just, I mean, I don't know really what we would have actually been able to do had we ever been attacked, but (laughs) we were, I guess, maybe lucky in that sense. But yeah, so Lake Baikal is spectacular. Um, Once we got to the northern end to uh, the city of Severobaikovsk, we spent a few few days there just kind of relaxing and recuperating. We had spent a day, actually one day in the middle of our Lake Baikal portion, and we stopped at these hot springs, and it's actually like a little resort where you can go and hang out with these... (laughs) These babushkas <laughs> and the, and uh, these open hot springs that are um, it's sort of full Russian Soviet experience, I guess. It's <laughs> jumping in these different pools that are, have different heat ratings. So you can start from like the baby, the kiddie pool that's got some freshwater cold springs that are added to it, so it's cooler, all the way to the full on like boiling cauldron pool and you're like you feel like your skin's gonna melt off and you've got all these like just rushes just sitting there like it's no big deal they do this every day <laughs> so we did that for a day and then we sorry then we went to like uh several by and it's a major fishing village in northern lake by call and it's it's weird because you're in this you feel like you're in this wilderness area for, for weeks and weeks and then you come up to this kind of bustling industrial city with trains and and a lot of driving everywhere and people selling hamburgers and hot dogs on the streets. And um, But we've met some really neat, really lively uh, Russians that have been traveling and kayaking as well. And um, Lake Falls is kind of considered just the, like the outdoor center of, I guess, central Russia. And a lot of people come to just play. And um, you can ski, you can whitewater kayak, you can canoe, you can sit, ski kayak. You can, there's lots of hiking you can do. I bet there's plenty of mountaineering looking at the mountains that we were seeing. And, and most of the peaks are unnamed. There's just so many of mountains. Uh, and then, of course, in the winter, you can ice skate and Nordic ski. And maybe maybe there's dog sledding. I don't know. So that was our second part, uh, and then the third part was going north into Siberia, and we paddled the Vitim River, which is spectacular. The Vitim is, is pretty unknown. I don't think many people have paddled it. Um, a lot of it was kind of flat at first and uh, windy and just kind of relaxing in a calm river, and then all of a sudden we just... <laughs> We hit these huge rapids. Like I, I've been in the Nile in, in Uganda, and I've seen some Class Fives, and, and these rapids were were at least on the same level of, of these rapids. And I just we were like, how, we there's no way we can get past these rapids. And so we had to put all our stuff together, collapse our canoe, and start kind of bushwhacking over these cliffs around around the river in it around the rapids and it took us a day and one time as I was carrying these backpacks I I felt all of a sudden I felt this like knock on my pack and I turned around and it was this Soviet soldier at least it seemed to me he was wearing his like military garb and holding this it was much more than a rifle (laughs) but I think he was using it for hunting I, I I'm not I don't know terms for guns or something, but it was a very large gun, I guess. Um, and he was standing with this beautiful white like Siberian husky, this massive dog. And we both kind of jumped back and we were looking at it just like, where, where are you, where did you come from? And both, you know, he was probably thinking the same thing and um, he's missing all his, his top teeth and his big grin and he just smiled and, and, and wanted us to come up the hill to his little hut to have tea. But we were, we were really concerned that we needed to 
just get keep going because of our, our timeline and to get to a place to sleep. And I think, you know, it was really wonderful for him to invite us in, but it was we had to we had to keep moving. But it was it was kind of neat that we ran into this soldier who was just out in the middle of nowhere. And I think that's kind of common. A lot of these men, like they're probably doing some gold mining out there, or um, they spend their summers kind of in isolation after just they. It's a, a life of freedom to just fish and hunt and. Um, maybe and look for some gold, and and that's how they spend their days after they spent their uh, finish their service. So then we finish the the Vitum, which is again just spectacular mountains, just these these mountains just jutting out of the river on either side, and the deep canyons and the windy rivers. And I think we at one point we clocked like 175 kilometers in one day on that river because it was so fast. We just put our paddles in the air, just cruise down. It was like riding an escalator down the river. Yeah, and then we finished um, at the at the Lena River, actually, which is really neat because as a child, that was a river that my family had spent a lot of time on, um, but we had been much much further north on the Lena River. But it was neat to just kind of follow my childhood footsteps and, and go back for a brief moment and then hung out in the village up there, and then we actually got to ride a hydrofoil back, which... I don't know if you've ever heard of a hydrofoil. It's a, it looks like this massive spaceship that kind of it rides above the water almost, and it, it's designed to go much faster than a boat because there's less friction. Um, but yeah, it's this crazy looking Soviet steel spaceship thing that just blasts down the river, and that's just the main mode of transportation for the, the for the villagers to get to the bigger city, which is like a 14 to 18 hour ride down this river. And then the, for the final portion of our trip, we we took a train east to Habarovsk, and then we paddled along the Amur River to almost to the Pacific Ocean, where we we had to finish at the Delta. But I mean, it, it would have, another hour of paddling, I bet we would have made it to the ocean. You could taste the salt water at the point where we were at on the Amur. Bria, why and did the, the, uh, why did you have to stop short? Because then we would have had to paddle upriver to get back to the village um, where we were we were getting a ride back to Khabarov. We couldn't, with the logistics, I think the only way, there's no way to have gotten ourselves back to this village. So, unfortunately, well, I mean, we really, for all purposes, we felt like we had we had made it. We could smell the salty air and, and there was, there were salt water seals, I guess, to differentiate, differentiate between uh, freshwater seals. There were saltwater seals that were in the river, too. And so, yeah, we felt like we had we had met, made our goal. And, and and also canoeing. We weren't sure about canoeing in the ocean either. We were not, just not sure what the water was going to be like and didn't want to put ourselves at risk. So, yeah, that wasn't... I mean, really, the whole point of it was the journey and not, like, making it exactly to the ocean. We were, we were really close. And now we kind of see in the distance, like, the horizon line just trailing off across the across the world. So that was... We, yeah, we made it. <laughs> if you were to do this again, what's one thing you would do different? You know, I, I would go longer. I would, I would extend it. I would take twice the amount of time. I'd probably try to spend more time in the villages, just getting to know the people and uh, the culture and the places. Maybe add a a hiking trip in the middle of it, perhaps. I'd love to paddle. I think a great trip would be to paddle from Lake Baikal all the way to the Arctic Ocean. Uh, That would take a lot of planning and and fast paddling and, and very efficient work. There's just, I mean, it's, there's endless canoeing in that part of the world. But it really, it was, it was a, I don't know, I, almost a flawless, perfect trip. We couldn't have asked for anything better. And so anything more that I could think of, it's just minor add-ons or, you know, the next trip, I guess. So it was really wonderful. Um, I think I would have uh, maybe worked on my Russian even more before having gone to it. It was really nice to be able to talk to people along the way, and I definitely felt like my Russian was coming back much faster towards the end and having really interesting conversations with people living in eastern, uh, the Far East Russia or in Siberia, and and just, you know, their situation. It's really incredible what they go through uh, living there and what they've experienced, and just wanting to be able to hear more of their stories, I guess, would would have been a really great experience, but my limited Russian could only go so far with fully understanding what they were trying to to share. 
Bria, what's next for you? Uh, what's next as far as adventures? Right now, my new my I'm in a, I'm in the grad school stage of life, and um, just finishing grad school is, is the next goal. And I'm I'm definitely excited to to get back out into the field as far as uh, my own adventures of, and getting back into the field with Knowles. I anticipate more mountaineering and climbing type trips in the future. And I, I think I, I'd also really like to do a more extensive uh, Nordic skiing based or polk or kite skiing based trip. I've, I've really thought a lot about going back up to Greenland and doing a ski polking or ski kite skiing expedition, but that I need to wait until I'm done with it. Until I'm done with grad school, so I can probably pay off some loans. And But I anticipate just being a lifelong endeavor, balancing the life between global health and <laughs> adventure travel. So. How can people contact you if they want to learn more about the expedition? Sure. You know, they can always contact me through my dad's business, actually, dogsledding.com. And that is a, if they really want to get a hold of me, yeah, that would be a great place and very easy to get a hold of me at dogsledding.com. And they can find the contact info there. And, and anyone that they reach out to at dogsledding.com would be able to get a hold of me. Okay, Bria Shirky, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story. And congratulations on the accomplishment and best of luck uh, in the future. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Enjoyed talking with you. Recorded January 26, 2014. For more great podcasts, visit thepursuitzone.com.